بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته One of the great values of our beautiful religion is respecting others' privacy. And this is not a glamorous word that is used to advocate and advertise for Islam. There is something that is practical, that is deep in our religion. And when you compare it to other cultures, you see the beauty of Islam, where it makes it not only illegal, but also contradicting with religion. It makes it sinful to invade other people's privacy. We look at the West and the way that celebrities live. We look at the paparazzis and how they try to get a photograph, a recording. We see what the tabloids do in terms of rumors and gossips. And we look at their laws and we see how so many loopholes exist that protects the intruders and does not protect people's privacy. In Islam, it's totally different. Not that Islam is against the freedom of speech or the freedom of press, as they call it. Islam is against harming others or invading their privacy because each one of us has been honored by Allah Azza wa Jal. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu was salam, the whole of a Muslim is sacred to another Muslim, his blood, his wealth, and his honor. This was stated by the Prophet alayhi salatu was in the farewell hajj, pilgrimage, which was the last great congregation that the Prophet ﷺ conducted only four months or so before he died. So respecting others' privacy meaning that you do not invade their privacy. You do not intrude in his own private affairs which he does not want others to look into. And this is why in Islam, we have something that is mentioned in the Quran in terms of seeking permission before entering a room or a house. Allah Azza wa Jal says, O oh you who believe, do not enter houses other than your own house until you ascertain welcome and greet their inhabitants that is best for you, perhaps you may be reminded. And if you do not find anyone therein, do not enter them until permission has been given to you. And if it is said to you, go back, then go back. It is purer for you and Allah is knowing of what you do. Allah is telling us if we knock on someone's door and he tells us, go back, I'm not in the mood to meet you. I don't have time. I have something that prevents me from hosting you. You should not feel depressed or sad or angered or humiliated. Rather, Allah says that this is purer for you, which is best. So it is part of the Islamic etiquette that when you come to a house that you seek permission to enter three times. And if no one answered, you leave in peace. 
And how is this done? By saying, Assalamu alaikum. Can I come in? Nobody replies. Assalamu alaikum. Can I come in? And you repeat it three times. No one answers, you leave. Even if there, there are people in the house and you can hear that. Nowadays, usually it is the doorbell that you ring in order for people to either accept you in or not. And seeking permission is for everyone, whether he's a relative or a stranger, whether he's a man or a woman, whether he is even a blind person. Some people say blind people can't see, so what's the problem in, of them entering a room or a house without seeking permission? They're blind, but they're not deaf. They may hear something that the people of the house don't want him to hear. And essentially, seeking permission was made so that you do not look. A man asked Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, should I seek permission before entering at my mom? He said, do you like to see your mother nude? He said, of course not. He said, then you have to seek permission. And not only that, the Prophet ﷺ made the punishment of a person who looks into your house without your permission, made it permissible for you to punish him with poking his eye. Even if you waste his eye, this is permissible. Well, why is that? Because he's transgressing against me. In the Sahih, a man was looking from cracks and holes in the door of the Prophet's house, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet had some sort of a comb in his hand, scratching his head with. So when he saw the man trying to peep into his house, he kept on following him so that he would poke him in his eye. And he told the man, if had I known that you were looking before, <clears throat> I would have stabbed you in your eye because seeking permission was made to prevent people from looking at other people's private uh, affairs. And Islam has protected this, has protected my privacy, has protected your privacy. When Allah stated in chapter 49, Surah Al-Hujurat, when Allah said, وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا Do not spy. And this incubates every type of spying, whether by looking, by hearing, by snooping. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, لَا تَحَسَّسُوا وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا تَحَسَّسُوا means do not listen. تَجَسَّسُوا means do not look. And some say no. تَحَسَّسُوا is to spy for your own benefit and تَجَسَّسُوا is to spy for other people's benefits. So what is meant by spying? All types of spying. So putting uh, remote um, monitoring cameras that people do not know. This is prevailing, unfortunately, in the West. So we have heard in non-Muslim countries, it is quite famous nowadays, the brand Airbnb, which is taking the place of hotels. If I want to go to a foreign country, instead of paying a, a bunch of money, a lot of money for the hotels, I can get half the price by renting through Airbnb, a flat or a house of a person who leaves it for a week or two and makes some extra cash. Now they have discovered that the owners of the houses hide and conceal cameras in bedrooms, in bathrooms. And this is outrageous. In Islam, it is totally sinful and people would be punished for that. So this is part of spying. Eavesdropping is part of spying. Tapping phones. Some people 
even do not respect your privacy. You speak to them and they turn the loudspeaker on so that everyone in the room can hear you without identifying this to or notifying this to the caller by telling, listen, uh, I've got my wife and my friends uh, in the car and they're listening to you. No, they just simply put on the loudspeaker. Some, they track movements and others would hack into systems or look into people's messages, files, emails without his permission. Others would crack a person's password in forums or in, on, in his own mobile. All of this is prohibited spying in Islam. The Prophet ﷺ warned the Muslims and he said, whoever eavesdrops while people are speaking and they hate it, they don't like people to eavesdrop or they are trying to escape from him listening to them, what is the punishment? The Prophet said والسلام, on the day of judgment, the melted type of white uh, lead would be poured into his ears. Billah. Melted lead that is white will be poured in his ears on the day of judgment. And <clears throat> Islam fights snooping and interfering in people's affairs and the prophet said والسلام, it is a sign of a person's excellent islam to mind his own business which means that those who do not mind their own business are not excellent muslims so many times you go to a random place and someone out of the blue comes to you and say, um, what do you work? My name is so-and-so, hi. He's trying to socialize and you try to socialize as well. But then he goes into areas he should not. What do you do? How much do you earn a month? How many wives do you have? How many children do you have? This is interrogation. And usually such people have no shame. They have the audacity to go on and on without any stop. And the best form of counterattacking them is to do the same. So he says, what do you do? You say, well, I'm a teacher. What about you? He says, well, I do this and this. And then he says, how much do you earn? So I said, no, not much. What about you? What's your salary? Do you do overtime? Do you have savings? How much do you have in your bank account? How many bank accounts do you have? And you bombard him with such questions and the guy would definitely stop because he would sense the gravity of his mistakes. Islam promotes that you keep people's secrets and not reveal them. Allah Azza wa Jal praised the believers that retain the entrusted things they're entrusted with and their promises and they keep it and part of the secrets that you have to retain and honor are what your friends speak to you see so many times i sit with a, a brother and as he speaks to me one to one he says listen sheikh i and he looks right and left and then he co continues Looking right and left means that this is a secret. The Prophet said, والسلام, whenever a man speaks and then he looks around, this is an entrusted amana. This is something that he's entrusting you with, so it's a secret, you should not disclose it. And keeping secrets is something natural. We all like to conceal. So many women in the family, when they get pregnant, they say, don't tell anyone until it is obvious, like in the sixth or seventh month. Why? They just don't like people to know. They like to keep things to themselves. And Yahya al-Marwazi, who was close to Harun al-Rashid, the caliph, he once was eating with him 
And all of a sudden, Harun al-Rashid spoke to his servant in Persian. So immediately, Yahya interrupted him and said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, if you want to tell him a secret, I just wanted to notify you that I myself know Persian. <coughs> so Harun was very happy of his comment because it showed that Yahya did not want to snoop or intrude by not saying anything and hear what the Khalifa had to say to his servant. So he interrupted him and said, listen, don't say anything because I know the language. And concealing secrets is well known uh, a characteristic of the Salaf. Umar ibn Khattab tells us a beautiful story that when his son-in-law died, Hafsa, his daughter, was without him a husband. So he went to Uthman, whose wife had died earlier. So he said, Uthman, how would you like to consider Hafsa, my daughter, for marriage? So Uthman said, give me a couple of days. And he went and came back and said, I tell you what, I don't feel like getting married. Zakallah khair. So he said, I went to Abu Bakr. And I said, Abu Bakr, my friend, I am thinking of having Hafsa married. So would you consider marrying her? Abu Bakr did not even reply to him and walked away. Umar says, I felt so bad about what he had done, more worse than what Uthman replied. And after a few days, the Prophet ﷺ proposed himself to Hafsa. And then Abu Bakr came and he said, Umar, my brother, don't be sad. Don't be angered with me or by me. Because a couple of days ago, I heard the Prophet ﷺ mentioning Hafsa's name and showing interest in marrying her. So when you approached me, I could not reveal and, 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 and disclose the secret of the Prophet ﷺ. That's why I did not reply to you. But now, as he had already proposed, so don't be mad with me. But subhanAllah, how Abu Bakr kept and concealed the secret of the Prophet ﷺ. And the secrets we keep are not only of those who are close to us, even we are supposed to conceal the secrets of sinners. Open your WhatsApp or Facebook. You'll find it filled with rumors and uh, uh, bad things and sins. So-and-so did so-and-so. This area did this. This organization did that. Disclosing people's hidden sins, not the sins that everyone can see. And this is wrong. This is intrusion on their privacy. It's between them and Allah Azza wa Jal. The sin is between me and Allah. If I go to my house and lock myself in and drink booze until I'm wasted, it's none of your business. This is between me and Allah. No one knows about it. If you happen to know, you have no right to go and tell people about it. And Allah will expose you on the day of judgment like you have exposed me. The Prophet ﷺ says, whoever conceals a Muslim, Allah Azza wa Jal will conceal him in this life and in the, in the hereafter. Imagine, though he's sinful, but you concealed him. And some of the scholars said that if I see a man and a woman committing fornication, I would conceal them with my garment. Because when you disclose this and show everybody that, oh, we have sins here, we have concerts here, we have movies here, we have theater here, we have mixing here. At the end of the day, my heart would be filled with despair. And I say, there's no hope. Islam is on the decline. There's no hope for us. So let's, let bygone be bygone. Let us do like everyone else. But when you conceal sin, then all what rises is virtue and Islam. And you respect the privacy, not on the, only of the living, but also of the dead. The Prophet ﷺ said, praising the person who washes 
a corpse of a Muslim. He says that whoever washes the corpse of a Muslim and he conceals what he sees, Allah would forgive him 40 times for zero. For what? Because I did not go out and say, Wallahi, this person I washed, his face was black, his body was as stiff as a rock, and every time I press his stomach, so much waste and defecation and, and feces comes out of him, he stinks, he's this, he's that. The people, especially his relatives, would think that this is the worst death a person could have, and he's bound to hell. And therefore, you would depress them and make them sad. Rather, do not say anything. Wash, do your job, and move on. Not only that, even the privacy of a deceased corpse in his grave is protected. The Prophet said, the breaking of the bone of a deceased corpse is like the breaking of the bone of a living person. So you have to respect the graves. You cannot sit on them. You cannot walk with slippers on graves. Imagine that. Just to uh, uh, observe, observe the uh, privacy of such a dead person. And there are so many ways Islam promotes protecting others' privacy. For example, the Prophet said, do not sit on roadsides. So the companion said, well, we, if we don't sit on roadsides, where, where can we meet? We have to do this, O Prophet of Allah. So the Prophet said, if you disobey me and insist on sitting on roadsides, in this case, you have to give the road its due right. So they said, what is the due right of the road? So the Prophet said, lowering your gaze refraining from harming others, enforcing virtue and good, and preventing evil and vice, and to reply, whoever gives you salam, you say wa alaykum salam. So you lower your gaze. If you go to the cafes in Mallorca, in Côte d'Azur, in these beach resorts, you will find that people sit there all day long, on the beaches, drinking the cappuccinos and lattes, and watching the filth in front of them on their beaches, gazing and looking at topless women, nude men, and things that are so heinous and filthy. Yet they fight the niqab. If a woman wants to conceal her beauty from others, oh, this is a taboo. If she wants to sell her body, like any uh, livestock, this is okay, no problem in that. Subhanallah. This is the right of the roadside uh, um, gatherings if you are w forced are forced to do it. And Islam has even reached a limit that no other religion had reached. And that is that it prohibits even doubt. The Quran, O oh you who believe, <clears throat> avoid much negative assumption. Indeed, some assumption is sin. So even assuming something that you don't have evidence on is haram in Islam. So just thinking is prohibited. Then what about acting, transgressing? taking his money or abusing him physically. Also part of Islam's respecting others' privacy is that you judge only what you see. You have no right to judge what's in my heart. You have no right to say, well, you intended to do so and so. You can only judge me by what I act and what I say. And this is why when Usama ibn Zayd, may Allah be pleased with him and with his father, was fighting against the idol worshippers and one of the knights was in a duel with him. When this disbeliever figured out that he's going to die, he stopped and he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I bear witness that there's no God other than Allah worthy of being worshipped. 
which means a declaration of Islam. In the midst of the battle, after he had killed so many Muslims, just because he figured out that Osama is going to beat him and kill him, Osama went ahead and killed him. When he, the Prophet heard this, والسلام, he was angered. And Osama apologized and said, O Prophet of Allah, he only said the testimony of faith to protect his, himself. Now, Osama judged his intention. Though you and I would have done probably the same, if not worse. The Prophet said, والسلام, did you open his heart? and looked at his intention. Where will you go from La ilaha illallah on the day of judgment? Osama was totally devastated. And he said, I wished that I did not accept Islam except on that particular day so that everything that I had done in the past would be erased and I begin a new chapter. So when we look at Fields of privacy, there's so many, but the time is so limited. And the control room are telling me that this is the time for break. But in, in a quick fashion, inshallah, we have to respect the privacy of the parents. So even they are my parents, I'm not allowed to go to their chambers without seeking permission. Especially in three times that were mentioned by Allah Azza wa Jal. Before dawn prayer, when they put aside their clothes at noon and after Isha prayer. These are the three times when they are in their chambers. I must not enter without seeking permission. Also, part of respecting their privacy when they fight, I should not intervene. A lot of the times we take sides and this angers the other side. So they are spouses, they are husband and wife. They can carry all their own problems unless they seek my intervention and my counseling, then this is a different thing. But to take sides and to uh, uh, intrude, again, this is not uh, a good thing. Children have their own privacy, so we should respect that, especially when the child grows and he doesn't want you to change his clothes or bathe him or he, he's becoming uh, more mature. Though he's five or six, respect that. Teenagers uh, have their own privacy. Don't spy unnecessarily on their mobile phones or on their emails. Don't check, check their clothes if they have this or that or documents unless there is reason beyond doubt. But other than that, give them their respect or you will spoil them. Likewise, if a, if a boy, is, if a teenager has his own desire to study a specific field, all what you can do is advice. But don't force him to be a doctor or an engineer or uh, an accountant if he doesn't want this, because this is part of his privacy. Also, the privacy between spouses. They don't go and display and expose their secrets to uh, other people and uh, uh, yani, uh, or even spy on their spouse's mobiles or emails or Facebook account just to see if he is chit-chatting or doing something haram because this is not uh, allowed in Islam. And finally, one of the righteous people who wanted to divorce his wife a man asked him, one of these Snoopy people, said, why do you want to divorce your wife? And the man said, subhanAllah, a man never discloses his wife's secrets. So after a while, he divorced her. So the same man came to him and said, why did you divorce your ex? He said, what should I care? She's someone else's wife now. So he did not disclose anything of her secrets, not before divorce, nor after divorce and the topic is quite big but we have to insert this value in our lives we have to teach our children how to honor it how to implement it in all aspects of their lives so that people could respect their privacies and they could respect other people's privacy as well we have a short break stay tuned and inshallah we'll be right back